Okay. Um. All right. So um, we're just going to have a day today to talk about novels in general. Um, and to uh, uh, just uh, see how we can approach them a little bit differently from approaching poems or short stories or plays. We'll talk about other kinds of genres later in the, the semester. Okay, so how should you approach a novel? You want to, as much as possible, take notes on the plot and character development that will help you keep track of major moments in the novel. So read closely, get the most out of every reading, but go back to examine major moments where you have an interpretation concerning a literary device that the author is using. Remember, we're always looking to build thesis statements for future essays, plot plus device equals meaning. Okay. Okay, novels in the first pages. So we just finished the very first parts of Dubliners. The beginnings of all novels will try to lure the reader into the story. The author needs to establish the rules of this world of the novel in those opening pages. So in Dubliners, you know, we learn that each story is going to contain an epiphany. Each story is missing something, something that is unsaid, that's important to understanding Joyce's point. We learn that we are within the geographical setting of Dublin, but that we're going to be exposed to a whole range of humanity. And, and we also are learning, you know, this is a realist novel. It's not a work of fantasy or science fiction. It's not a Victorian novel. We see you know, kind of from those first few pages, the type of book we are reading, and we're meant to accept the rules of that fiction. The author wants you to commit to the novel at the very beginning. So you're meant to understand those rules and then be drawn into the whole work. Pay attention to those opening lines. What tone does the author strike? What predictions can you make? We see at the beginning of this book that we are uh, dealing with children and then young adults, where is Joyce going from here? What sorts of things will he have to say about the older people of Dublin? Okay, the setting. So a novel is made up of, uh, is a made up world in a made up place. Even though Dublin is a real place that exists in our world, Joyce is not setting his story in real Dublin. This is the Dublin of his imagination. It's filtered through his mind and his reflection. So it's important that we remember that. We're not meant to take everything realistically, even when the novel is a realist novel. Okay. Our job is to accept those rules, you know, whether we are in um, a, a Tolkien novel of fantasy or a novel that takes place in outer space or a novel like this one, our job is to accept those rules and suspend disbelief. Who is in charge? Okay, so different kinds of narrators. Third person omniscient. This would be the godlike narrator that's everywhere and all at once. This was a very popular form of storytelling in the Victorian period when novels were told with either an outside narrator who would give you the truth in all forms, um, or at least uh, someone that you could trust. So Victorian period uh, narrators did not deviate into unrelatable narrators or things like that. Third person omniscient. Third person limited, that is when we the narrator identifies with only one character, goes where he goes, sees what he sees, and records his thoughts. Okay, so uh, think of a dill pickle. You know, we had a third person, an outside voice, but we only really knew the character of Vera in that story. Stream of consciousness. Of course, this is going to be like the lady in the looking glass. Uh, the lady in the looking glass is, you know, uh, all written in stream of consciousness. And in fact, in that story, it's not clear if the narrator is sane or mad. 
So we have to remember when stream of consciousness happens, it's as the thoughts are running through a character's mind. And we then have to decide what kind of mind are we looking at. Other types of narrators. All right, first person central. This is a character that tells his own story. Often this means he is unreliable. So the character in Araby is telling his own story, but it's clear it's an adult voice. He speaks as an adult. He doesn't sound like a little child for one thing. Uh, also, he can't remember Mangan's sister's name. Uh, I'm sure he at one point knew her name, but he has forgotten. So there's other clues. And because it's his memory, we have to assume that he's prejudicial in some way or jaded in some way. We have to interpret the character based on you know, the story that we're given. All right, first person secondary. This is if the story is told by the sidekick telling his friend's story. Okay, and uh, Sherlock Holmes, for example, would be a good a good uh, version of this. this Watson uh, is the chronicler of Sherlock's uh, story. So first person secondary in the story, but not the main character. All right, and then we also have to consider that sometimes we're going to have anti-heroes. Now, during the Victorian period, again, just before the modernist era, we had narrators who were central characters and they were unequivocally, I believe, the good guy. The protagonist meant good. The modernist writers began experimenting with the anti-hero. And this is a character who was the main character, does terrible things, but nonetheless engages with the reader in his or her own story. So, uh, you know, we are uh, always looking for uh, characters who we might in some way relate to, even though they do terrible things. The anti-hero is very common today, um, it, but that was a modernist phenomenon, something that didn't happen before this time period. All right, chapters, why are they there? <laughs> they are useful to readers in that they let you know when some significant unit of time or action has passed. They are little mini structures within the novel that support the larger structure of the novel. So in Dubliners, it's particularly interesting because each chapter is of course a little story. Your question should be, how does it support the larger structure of the novel on, you know, on the whole? All right, and of course, Victorian novels often ended with cliffhangers because Victorian novels were published usually in serial form in cheap newspapers. So they wanted you to buy the next chapter. Modern novels do not always do that. Uh, we, we don't normally read novels in that way anymore. So sometimes there are cliffhangers, sometimes there aren't. Some novels today, of course, have no chapters, in which case time or action might occur differently um, or, or be reflected differently. All right, descriptions, when you have long descriptions of setting or place or character, you want to look for the places where authors describe things like a reporter, almost giving you like a beat by beat uh, rundown of important pieces of information necessary so that you understand what's coming. Okay. You want to look for similes and metaphors. So similes used to uh, in descriptions to help set the mood. Okay, a sentence like overhead, the factory smoke was like a dark monster that crawled across the sky. So your interpretation of that metaphor is going to help you understand the author's meaning behind the text. So the smoke described as a monster is a incredibly treacherous, ominous, almost terrifying description that probably would hook into something larger, uh, a larger point that the author is making. Okay. Sentences that show speculation on the part of the viewer. These could be interpretations given to you by the author, um, and they're meant to connect you to those larger puzzle pieces. 
Some evil overlord was wringing his hands and laughing as his henchmen blocked the sun and our hope with one fell swoop. Okay, so you are meant to find those key phrases, key sentences that allow you to accurately interpret character or setting or something else significant going on. All right, general advice, look for foreshadowing, irony and humor and other literary devices used to move the story along. Joyce particularly makes use of dark humor. He makes use of language and colloquialisms, all important things for you to look up and make note of as you go. Take notes and answer your study guide, but you can't critically think about literature until you comprehend the basic details of the story. So make sure you understand the plot and what's happening in the story before you try to move on and try to dig deeper and interpret it.